Okay, good evening, everybody. Yeah. As Bob was saying, this one is perhaps a little different for an astro society. It's wild astronomy, but there's more wild than there is astronomy in this particular talk. So bear with me. If you're desperate to get to the astronomy bit, there will be some, but that's not what most of the talk is about. This is supposed to be perhaps just a little more entertainment than hardcore astronomy. And uh, given that we are now projecting onto a TV rather than a screen, I've now realised my laser pointer is of no use whatsoever. <laughs> so I'll see how we can manage. So wild astronomy. The basic idea is go somewhere nice and look at the wildlife by day and the stars at night and sleep when you get home. There's no point in wasting good holiday time. So I guess a lot of us have an interest in astronomy and some of, for some of us that overlaps with photography and uh, I'm sure some of you have dabbled with astrophotography but some individuals might also have an interest in nature more generally and the idea of looking and photographing wildlife is also of interest and if you decide as I have done with some friends to go on holiday for instance to Africa to go into the true wild then you can see wildlife, and if you take a pair of binoculars to see wildlife, those binoculars also allow you to see the stars at night. And you have the advantage, if you're going somewhere exotic, like let's say the middle of Africa, East Africa, you're at a different latitude, so of course you see further south than you can see from England, and you can get away from the streetlights. In some cases, the nearest streetlight might be hundreds of miles away. So you get a different sky, and you get an incredibly dark sky. So that's what wild astronomy is. It's why not combine all three of these interests. Wildlife, either visual or photographic. Astronomy, whether it be visual or photographic. Why not combine all those together? And one way of doing that is to do some wild astronomy. And this example is friends of mine that have been to East Africa on safari. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about going on safari, where to go, what to take. I'll be looking at accommodation, where you might stay, how you might live whilst you're out. You don't necessarily camp out on the grass savannas, but that is an option if you so wish. How to see the wildlife, that's often through game drives, where you go driving out for a few hours to see the animals. How you go about capturing all this wonderful uh, sight to behold. And then we're talking about astrophotography under the very darkest of skies. So in the early part, I'll be mentioning some early attempts at astrophotography, and then I'll be talking a little more about it at the end there. So let's start with going on safari. So I'm talking about specifically a group of friends, and I, at this point, perhaps ought to uh, acknowledge the fact that I'm using photographs of mine and some photographs from my friends, Sue and Rob Dipple and Jeff Sutton, who helped me put this talk together. And so I'm using some of their images as well. So we're talking about going on safari to Kenya and Tanzania. So uh, you might fly out to Nairobi there in Kenya, or you might fly out to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. My friends and I have visited quite a few national parks uh, in the area. I'm not going to talk through them all. That just gives you an idea of the sort of spread from Kenya through the Masai Mara, through the Serengeti, into uh, the middle of Tanzania. So what might you take with you if you do want to go on safari? <laughs> well, sun cream's not a bad idea. It's not necessarily blazingly hot, but yes, it, it can be a little bit warm and it's definitely exposed to the sun. So sun cream's a good idea, a hat is a good idea. You might want to take insect repellent. That's probably a good idea depending on where you're going. And of course, one problem is uh, mosquitoes. So it's a good idea to take malaria tablets regardless of whether you think your insect repellent is working or not. It's always a good medical advice to take malaria tablets. You might want to take a good bird book with you or an animal book to make sure you recognize an elephant when you see one, just in case you don't know what they look like. And you don't need huge pairs of binoculars. 10 by 42, I have found, are uh, ideal. There's usually plenty of light if you're, if you're watching animals during the day, so you don't need huge objective lenses. And even 10 by 42s are still great for astronomy. And they are particularly small and light, which means if they are around your neck for a lot of the day, you don't get neck ache. And of course, you might want to take a camera with you if you want to record all of the animals and all the stars that are out there. Back in the day, remember the day when you used to take film with you? Yep. 
and you used to get a massive, yes, massive 36 exposures per roll of film. But the problem was, how many films do you take? If you're going out on safari for a fortnight and there's loads of animals, how can you possibly guess how many pictures you're going to take? So you simply take as much film as you think you're going to need. In my case, it was something like 20 rolls of film. And I still ran out and had to buy some more when I was out there. These days, of course, everybody has gone digital. Pretty much everybody has gone digital. And I don't suggest you take just one SD card for your camera. But if you wished, you can buy a terabyte SD card, a thousand gigabytes. And that will give you, I don't know, 100,000 images on one card. I suggest you actually don't put all your eggs in one basket. I suggest you take a few smaller ones. But it's sobering to think that instead of trying to work out how many rolls of film you need to take, in principle, you can just take a card and you will never fill it up. So you go out to Africa. What are you going to see? Uh, you get off the plane and you see these vast grasslands in the distance. Well, no, you see Nairobi Airport is the first thing you see, and you have to figure out where's the van that's supposed to pick us up and take us somewhere interesting. There can be a little bit of chaos when a few hundred tourists arrive on a few planes at a given time, in this particular case, early in the morning. But hopefully, if things are well organized, your driver will pick you up and will take you on your safari van to your first destination, which hopefully is a place where you can really start to soak in the atmosphere, as it were. In the top right there, you see a rather chilling environment of sit on a veranda and just uh, look over a watering hole. In the bottom left, that's just a random picture of some African bush. And it's a reminder that sometimes the animals are out in the open and sometimes the animals feel a lot more um, protected, as it were, a lot more comfortable in the, uh, in the safety of the bush. And you probably can't see on this particular image, but here we actually have um, some zebras on the left, an elephant on the right, behind it a giraffe, and then to the left another elephant, and then to the left another giraffe, then another elephant, then another giraffe. So that particular picture has actually got three giraffes, three elephants, and about ten zebras in it. And that's simply from standing there and looking. It's a reminder that you sometimes have to actually look for the animals, not because they're scarce, but just because they're in a bush and you can't see them until they move or make a noise or whatever. So that's just a reminder of how it works. You don't have to travel by car, by van. If you wish, you can fly wherever you want to go, from one lodge to another, from one national park to another. But of course, the cost then goes up enormously if you want to fly. The flight might be 10 times quicker than going by road, but it could easily be 10 times more expensive. Uh, and these little bush aircraft are great. Uh, you will fly from one place to another, such as the Rufiji International Airport that you can see here, which is uh, an airstrip. The, the, the plane has to overfly it to scare off the animals, to make sure there are no animals on the runway. So they overfly it to scare the animals away and then come back to actually land. And this, this uh, little apron there you can see is the, is the main apron of the uh, International Airport of Rufiji which is one of the, the, uh, the camps in Tanzania. So, lodges and camps, where might you stay if you want to go on safari in East Africa? Well, there are lots of very nice lodges here of my friends, and on the left is David, our driver and guide, who over the years has become our friend, because originally he was simply allocated to us as the person who was going to drive us around when we were on safari but we've been back since and uh, for a few years we simply requested that we have that individual because we liked him and got friendly with him and now this is the individual who actually arranges our safari we email him and say David we want to go on safari sort it out for us we book the flights he takes care of everything else. We say where we want to go and how many nights we want to spend here or there. He does all the local booking and the local arrangements, which is great for us. He takes care of everything. This particular scene is the view from a lodge overlooking one of the lakes uh, in uh, East Africa. We've got the Great Rift Valley running through um, Kenya and Tanzania. And so there are a lot of fault lines and a lot of lakes that have been generated as a result. So there's quite a few lakes in the area of uh, the middle of Kenya. This is a, a sort of fairly typical room. Notice that we do not slum it. 
my friends and I are of an age where we don't really want to go backpacking to keep things as cheap as possible. We've built up a little bit of a nest egg and we would rather pay for comfort. So you get a proper bed, you get mosquito nets, you get a proper toilet and shower, etc. Western sanitation, if you like. So it's all very nice. All, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't in any way slum it. It's not a Spartan existence when you're there. Many of the lodges are in very nice places. The lodges are there for the tourists. That is their raison d'etre. So, of course, they have been placed in the nicest parts of the area. So, in this particular national park, this lodge is positioned on the top of a hill, so you have these grand vistas over the Masai Mara, the vast grasslands at the south, uh, in the uh, southeastern part, sorry, the southwestern part of uh, Kenya. And on a good day, you can simply watch the wildebeest uh, crossing the river in the distance. One of my favorite, one of our favorite lodges is this one towards the, uh, the southeast of Nairobi. And it's a lodge called Kilaguni. And that is a typical sort of stance. Wherever possible, yes, you might go out on game drives to go and watch animals. But one option is just to sit there watching the watering hole, and just with a little bit of patience, you wait until the animals come to you. You don't go searching for animals. You just kick back, sit in a chair with a pair of binoculars, with a camera, and wait for the animals. In this particular picture, there don't seem to be any anim animals there, which is why one of my friends got up to take this particular picture. But generally speaking, you can, if you wish, just sit there all day, and, uh, and just see what happens. And then you notice there's a pecking order. First come the elephants, and they have a drink, and then they wander off, and then come the zebras, and they have a drink, and then they wander off, and then come the baboons. You realize that somehow they all coordinate themselves, so it's not just a free-for-all when it comes to taking a drink. So that is a contented man. That is a man on holiday who's sitting on the veranda. He's got his telephoto lens on the tripod, pointed at the watering hole, He's got binoculars round his neck. He's skimming through a bird book to find out what, what bird he's just photographed. And every once in a while, somebody brings him coffee or something stronger, perhaps. And basically, that, if you wish, is the life of being on holiday. You don't have to jump into a safari van and go on game drives. If you prefer things a little more sedentary, then that's fine. That's a wonderfully comfortable place to just sit and wait and see what happens. Every once in a while, you get beautiful views. In this case, this is Eland, who came down to drink at sunrise. And, uh, and so you get this wonderful view, not only of the very low sun hitting the Eland, which are very similar in terms of their, their, the color of their coats to the background dirt, as you can see, the background dust. But, uh, but at this particular time in the morning, we got a beautiful reflection from them as well. In addition, you can not only stay there all day and watch the animals, but because the uh, watering holes are often floodlit, you can do that into the evening as well. The animals don't mind if it's floodlit. To them, it's just the same as a full moon. So it doesn't really make a lot of difference to the animals. They're always on the lookout for predators if they are prey animals. But generally speaking, having a little bit of lighting around the watering hole doesn't really upset the, uh, the ecosystem. So there are various lodges where you can literally, if you, wish, if you wish, watch animals all day and all night. So I thought I'd try some astrophotography. This is one of my first attempts in 2003 with film, with slide film. Uh, I tried pointing at the sky. This is just a static camera on a tripod, pointed at the sky, exposed for a couple of minutes. The stars have trailed slightly. Perhaps you can just about make up the S of Scorpius down in the bottom right. We can't see all of Scorpius from the UK, but from the equator, of course, it's high in the sky and easy to see. But the Milky Way isn't coming out very clearly here, basically because, well, it's, um, it's slide film. It was something like 100 or 200 ISO, not particularly sensitive, not a particularly fast lens. And with a two-minute exposure, the bright stars come out, but it's very difficult to see anything in the Milky Way. So I thought, well, hmm, it's a little disappointing because what I can see is beautifully dark skies, but I'm not really able to capture it with photographic film. We'll see another attempt a little later. So lodges have characters all to themselves. 
Uh, this particular set of lodges, where the individual rooms were on stilts, so everybody got an elevated view, everybody could see over the grassy plains. If they wanted to sit in their rooms, not many people do, but if you wanted to sit in your room, you could do that and see the animals. Most people would congregate in the restaurant or the social areas if they wanted to do any animal watching. Uh, this particular lodge is actually situated right on the rim of a crater, the so-called Ngoro Ngoro crater in Tanzania, a very large ecosystem where a number of animals inside are virtually trapped inside in the sense that they never leave the crater, and hence you get a particular ecosystem building up of prey and predators. And the lodge on the caldera on the edge of the rim of the crater is such that you get this beautiful beautiful view looking into the base of the crater itself. Africa is not all dusty plains. In some cases there is very rich and lush uh, vegetation as you can see here. One of the lodges in the, in the Masai Mara. Um, this is still within the grounds of the lodge so you could simply go on a, a walk or a bird walk and you can see that there's a lot of lush vegetation meaning a lot of interesting bird life. One of our favorite lodges is this one, for a reason I'll come to in just a moment. This is Amboseli National Park, which is famous for its elephants towards the, um, close to the Kenya-Tanzania border. And there's one of my friends, Rob, uh, sitting outside uh, one of the rooms there. You can see it's a very pleasant area. The, uh, the actual grounds of the lodge has been, uh, been beautifully kept to make sure that it's uh, nice for tourists. Again, if you wanted not to leave the lodge, you could simply do a bird walk just by looking around the grounds itself and see an enormous variety of bird life. You notice there is a prevailing wind. Uh, it's, it, it's not as strong as those trees would have you believe. There's usually a breeze. There's often a breeze. It's not quite as uh, strong as those would indicate. But one reason we like this lodge, you can't see too well, but over on the right-hand side, the trees start to thin out which means it is possible to just walk a little bit away from the trees and you get the beautiful skies without being too much uh, interrupted by trees in the immediate vicinity. And what you might just be able to make out on the horizon on the right-hand side is an electric fence, which means this lodge is safe. You can go out at night and you don't have to worry about any animals coming onto the compound. There's quite often staff who patrol anyway just to be on the safe side, but basically it is possible to do astrophotography at a place like this because the electric fence keeps the animals out. So uh, my friend Rob and I tried doing that by moving out to the right-hand side and then um, taking some pictures. Again, 2003, again, uh, color film. That's some um, slide film on the left from me and Rob took some color print film on the right. So we got similar sorts of results. But of course, if you take a shortish exposure, you see some structure within the Milky Way. If you take a longer exposure, as indicated by the longer star trails on the left-hand side, then the Milky Way, of course, starts to blur. So there's something interesting going on in there, but we can't really see all the detail that is in the Milky Way because, again, we're just using static cameras with a wide-angle lens on a fixed tripod, and so we're limited to either taking very short exposures, in which case you don't see much, or longer exposures, in which case the stars move or trail. So this was another reminder that, well, if only we could stop the stars trailing, these pictures would be fantastic. It's a shame that we're limited with what we have there. As well as lodges, which are usually made of local stone, there is always the option of the tented experience for those that want to actually go under canvas. This is, again, not Spartan. It's not a bivouac. It's a big tent, and there's comfortable, for instance, bed and mosquito net and some sanitation inside. But it does give you the experience, because whilst you're asleep under canvas, you can hear what's going on around you. And so you do get the experience of listening to whatever wildlife is out there. This looks very nice. This is Governor's Camp. Perhaps you've heard of this. This is where they film Big Cat Diary and things like that. So Governor's Camp, again, some nice tents, some trees by the Mara River. This all looks very nice. And you think, oh, this would be wonderful for astrophotography just to get away from the trees there. That would be fantastic. But the people there say, don't come out of your tent at night. The, the, uh, the staff at the Governor's Camp say, once it's dark, do not leave your tent. Or 
we will come and get you and take you if you wanted to go somewhere, if you're going from the restaurant back to your tent and it's already dark, we will escort you back to your tent. Or if there's a problem, let us know, shine a torch at us and we will come and collect you and take you. Never leave your tent um, uh, at night unless we know what you're doing. And I thought, well, why? It can't be that dangerous. We're in Africa. What can happen? Um, but I found out one morning, after the, the, the second day, when I thought that would have been nice. It was clear last night. It would have been nice to have gone out. But I found out why. Outside my tent was a paw print. And I'm told that is a lioness from the people who know about these things. They said, quite definitely, that's a lioness. So yes, a lioness walked outside your tent sometime during the night. And that reminded me that astrophotography is a great idea sometimes, uh, but there are certain places where you don't do it. And if you are in a camp, it doesn't matter whether it's tented or, or lodged, but if you're in a camp that does not have an electric fence and you cannot guarantee that the animals can't get in, then it's possibly not a good idea to go out and take pictures. Ho-hum. So, uh, another tented camp, a rather nice one in Tanzania, called uh, Salu, the Salu Game Reserve. And this is another place where I thought I'm a little bit further south in Tanzania compared to Kenya. Maybe I can see a little bit further south in terms of the southern constellations. Let's have another crack at a camera on a tripod. So again, an early attempt. This time I have gone digital. This is now 2005 and I've changed from slide film in a manual camera to a digital camera. But still, a camera on a static tripod and if you expose for too long, the stars will trail. So now I'm exposing for a couple of minutes or so. And if you keep the pictures small, you can hardly notice the stars trailing. And you get a nice uh, structure of the Milky Way there. And, uh, and again, the Milky Way shows nicely. But you don't have to blow these up too much to realize that all the stars are trailed. And of course, you will never see more detail in the Milky Way by exposing for longer, because it will just blur more because of the movement of the stars. So I took a few images and I thought, well, this is OK, but there's got to be a better way of doing this. I looked at this image and I thought, oh, that's not bad. Uh, we've got Alpha and Beta Centauri there because we're looking quite a way south here. There's the coal sack of the, uh, the Southern Cross, which is just to the right of the circle as indicated. And I thought, well, we're now doing digital photography. We're no longer just taking slide or color print film. It is now possible to say, well, let's not take a two-minute exposure. Let's take a series of shorter exposures and then stack them to try and avoid any movement of the stars. It doesn't work too well, mainly because in this particular case, I wasn't exposing for long enough to get enough data. So in principle, yes, the stars are now points, but I'm still not getting a lot of structure in the Milky Way. So it's not even looking as nice as just a two-minute exposure allowing the stars to drift. So after 2005, I decided I want to do something about this. And so I figured that next time I go on safari, I'm going to take a star tracker with me that will allow me to track the sky and keep all the stars pinpoint. And then hopefully I'll get better images of the Milky Way. And we'll see the results of that in a little while. Meantime, back to the animals. When you're on safari, you have the choice of just staying at the uh, lodge or the camp, if you wish. But most people would prefer to go on game drives. Game drives are usually something like a couple of hours long, and typically it will be a game drive in the morning as soon as the sun rises. Depending on the local rules, you're not allowed to go and hassle the animals during the night. That's when they do their hunting most of the time. So you can go and do as much observing of the animals as you like during the day, but not during the night. So quite often game drives will be a couple of hours in the morning as soon as the sun rises. So on the equator, roughly speaking, the sun rises at 6 a.m. and sets at 6 p.m., roughly speaking. It doesn't change much across the year. So you might go out at 6 a.m. and come back at 8 a.m. and have breakfast. The rest of the day you can do what you like, and then perhaps another game drive at the other end of the day, a couple of hours before sunset, so that you finish by the time the sun sets. So that's uh, fairly typical. There's us with our driver guide, David. and. Uh, Safari vans often are just converted ordinary people carriers, if you like. You can see in this case it's got a, a roof that lifts up, which means that basically everybody gets a view. You can, if you wish, stay seated and look out of the window, but it's generally designed for the fact that you can stand up comfortably, 
Um, you know, we're basically six foot tall and we can comfortably stand with the roof in that position. In the background there, over Rob's right shoulder, is Kilimanjaro in the distance. We're in Kenya, Kilimanjaro is in Tanzania. So it's in a different country, but you can see it. That tells you how big the mountain is. Notice that just uh, to inboard of my right hand there, you see a camera mount, a pan and tilt head. What I often do is take a pan and tilt head with me and simply bolt it to the side of the van. As soon as the roof goes up, I just clamp one of those pan and tilt heads to the side there. You notice uh, Rob's got one at the back as well. And that just gives a little extra support. So you might have a camera and a telephoto lens, and you might be just holding it in your hand. But it's always nicer if you can just rest it on something. And so resting it on a pan and tilt head just gives a little extra support. Yes, the van might still be moving, depend on whether people are moving inside, but a little extra support just means that you, your images might be just a little crisper and less prone to camera movement. There's plenty of room in the van we have found, and generally speaking we don't spend all of the time with, a, with our faces pressed up against a, a camera viewfinder. It is not unusual just to scan the horizon and take in the views and take in the ambiance, maybe have a pair of binoculars handy. But again, this is fairly typical in that it is not unusual. It's not a question that we're not talking to each other. It's just that we're looking in different directions. If there's four people in the van, why not look in the different cardinal directions? Because you're more likely to catch stuff. There might be just a glimpse of something in the undergrowth there. And there might be, ah, right, there's some giraffe there. One person spots them, and then the other people can... Uh, can start observing. Yes, the driver guide is also trying to spot animals, but if there's a few of you and you're looking in different directions, you're much more likely to catch what animals are out there. Do you need a big telephoto lens if you're going to take pictures of animals? Do you need something that looks like it's... I mean, you've got to admire the biceps of that guy, haven't you? Look at that. Uh, yes, that is a real lens, the Sigma 200 to 500. Um, I'm not sure of anybody who's actually bought one. They are not the cheapest lens. Um, and yes, uh, you do find some um, people who are interested in birds in particular have rather long focal lengths. Um, none of my friends, but occasionally you see other people in the lodges you visit, and occasionally you see other people in other safari vans. And some people who want to take a picture of a tiny bird at a huge distance, they might have huge telephoto lenses. I have found over the years that the ideal lens for me is a 300 millimeter lens. That's a, a Nikon 300 millimeter. You can see it's about the size of your hand. It doesn't need to be something which three people are needed to carry. Um, and I have found that lens is fantastic for wildlife and fantastic for astrophotography as well. So at the moment, I don't want anything more than that. In the past, it's always a question of, I'm going on safari. Do I want a different camera? Do I want a different lens? I have now decided that is the lens for me until Nikon make a better one. That will happen eventually, I guess. So the question is, with a 300 millimeter lens, how close do you have to get? Do you have to sneak up on animals? Is it a problem getting close enough to take a decent picture? Well, this particular lion, perhaps you can tell, there's a little bit of a breeze, and the lion is just pointing his snout into the breeze so that the mane has the best effect possible of the breeze just blowing through it. But to give you an idea of how close you can get, that's a picture that one of my friends, Sue, took over my shoulder. You can see that lions don't give a damn. Lions are at the top of the food chain. They don't really care if you, well, you don't sneak up on them, but if you drive up to them, they know you're there, but they know you're not a threat. They know they can eat you if they want to. Therefore, it's not a problem. With prey animals, if they are likely to get eaten, they're a little more skittish. So small antelopes, etc., and some birds are less likely to hang around if you get close to them, if you get to within 10 or 20 meters of them. But there are plenty of animals that really don't care, and so you can get close. So a 300 millimeter lens, for instance, uh, you can see on the right, a 300 millimeter lens from that distance gives you the sort of picture that you have on the left, a sort of head and shoulders shot, if you like, of an animal. And a reminder that some animals don't care. Here's a leopard. Leopards are sometimes very difficult to see. They tend to stay in the trees, and uh, basically they are visible, but they are well camouflaged against the foliage of a tree, so sometimes they're rather difficult to see. This particular leopard just was sitting at the side of the road, which is on this, this dirt track on the right-hand side. You can see part of the safari van in the foreground. 
So, you, you know, this, this leopard was only 10, maybe 15 metres in front of us and wasn't too fussed because it didn't see us as a threat, nor food in this particular case. And our driver reminded us that as long as we don't hassle the animals, as long as we respect the animals, as long as we don't go hounding them and drive after them as they move away, then basically they are quite happy to coexist with the occasional tourist. Not only that, but if your driver or your guide is experienced, they will give you invaluable advice. For instance, if that animal starts to walk away, David said to us, we are not going to drive down this road and follow it in the hope of getting a better picture. What we're going to do is drive not quite in the opposite direction. We're going to go over there. Because if we go over there a few hundred metres, that leopard is going to walk that way and then take a left and is going to walk towards that water source over there. So if we go over there and stop and wait, it will walk in front of us. And that's exactly what happened. And so this particular leopard just walked in front of us, literally just a few metres away. Uh, I don't think it was a great deal more than the distance from me to the centre of this audience, for instance. And the leopard knew we were there. It didn't even look at us. It didn't give us a second glance. It just was walking from A to B to get to the water. There was a safari van there. It knew the safari van wasn't a threat, so just continued to do what it normally did. And so we got this beautiful view of the leopard slowly walking towards us, culminating with this beautiful image as it sort of broadsided us. So again, with a very modest telephoto lens. You don't need a huge one because if you get it right, you are not that far from the animals. You're not half a mile away. You're at most tens of meters away. There's us waiting for our next game drive. So this is an afternoon game drive. We're ready and waiting. Our game drive starts at four o'clock. So we're there at half past three, chomping at the bit, waiting to get out. Quick cup of coffee, perhaps. Um, cameras at the ready, all charged up, all batteries charged during the day, and then we're off. Once we come back from a game drive, we do a little bit of chimping. You know what chimping is? L looking at the pictures on the back of your camera, going, ooh, 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 ah, 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 and, and comparing to try and figure out who's got the best picture of the leopard. So this is what we're doing here. As it happens, Rob seems to have a huge telephoto lens on, and I have a, a wide-angle lens. As it happens, we probably changed at some point during the, uh, during the game drive. But it is not unusual, before you go to dinner, to have a quick look at, did those pictures come out? Something, of course, you couldn't do with film. You take lots of film, and you keep your fingers crossed that everything worked, and then after you get home, two weeks later, after processing in boots, you then find that one worked, that one didn't, that one was out of focus, that one looks OK. With digital photography, of course, you can find out seconds afterwards, or in this case, uh, a few minutes afterwards, you can just go through the images and say, yeah, that looks good. What was that bird? Let's zoom in a little bit further. Ah, it was that bird, if we compare with the bird book, for instance. Yep. So chimping is a quite common practice, uh, at, especially at the end of the day. So let's have a look at some wildlife images. That looks like, I don't know what it looks like, just speckled things in the distance. But if we zoom in, you realize that what we're actually looking at is thousands upon thousands upon thousands of wildebeest and zebra and ostrich. Being a scientist, I looked out and tried to work out how many wildebeest there were per, per square meter and how many square meters we could see from this vantage point and I came close to a million. At this particular point, something like 1.5 million wildebeest had come from Tanzania on the great wildebeest migration virtually every year, virtually the same time, depending on the rains, because the rains determine where the grass is and the grass determines where the wildebeest are. Wildebeest follow grass, grass grows in the rain. So depending on the rain pattern, you can predict what the wildebeest are going to do. And roughly speaking, in the autumn of, uh, well, it's not really autumn in the sense it's our autumn, but it's in sort of September time, there will be lots of wildebeest coming through from uh, Tanzania, having calved in the, uh, in the spring, the, the male and female and calf wildebeest will come up into Kenya, and then you get these huge herds coming through the Maasai Mara. 
And so a million wildebeest is not really um, an exaggeration. It's something of order that number, somewhere between one and two million wildebeest typically in a given year. Not only that, but occasionally you will see birds in large numbers. It is not unusual to go to lakes and find huge numbers of flamingo, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of flamingo. What we weren't expecting in this case is to approach a lake and realize that there were thousands of pelicans which decided to lift off. I don't think they were disturbed by us. They decided to fly as we started to approach the lake. And so we had this spectacle of a thousand pelicans just wheeling over our heads in a sort of a thermal as they started to gain height. It's very easy to look at that and say, oh, it's just a bunch of seagulls. But when you remember how big pelicans are, it is quite a, quite a spectacle. Animals are curious. Some of them might run away, but not all of them. And it's very interesting to note, not only are zebra quite curious and will often stare at us for a while, maybe they're just making sure that we aren't lions. Maybe they're just being on the safe side. Um, lions might be interested in what we're doing, not because they think we're food, but they just might be wondering what we're up to. But it's always nice to see the youngsters, like the young giraffe on the left. Um, we got the impression that the youngster was quite curious as to what we were. It's possible the youngster had never seen a tourist before, depending on the season, depending on whether you go in the, uh, the well-trodden uh, tracks or whether you go somewhere that most tourists don't go. Um, Kenya and Tanzania are big places. There's plenty of places you can go where tourists don't normally go. So it might be that that youngster had never seen a tourist bus before. And you get the impression that the mother probably has seen one before, but was just checking us out to make sure the youngster was safe. And so you get this wonderful dynamics, this wonderful an animal behavior every once in a while. We'll see this uh, lion in the bottom right again, because that's her. In this particular case, this again was wonderful um, animal behavior. We realized that there was a mother and cubs coming from the right. And what we didn't realize at first was that the mother and the cubs separated and the cubs walked across in the long grass where we can't see them. But the mother wanted the cubs to walk through that long grass. And she was quite definitely in control of this, position, uh, of this situation. She simply came up onto the bough of the tree and sat there in between us and her cubs. And it was pretty obvious she was just placing herself there to make sure there was no possibility of us coming any further forward and getting any closer to her cubs. So she sat there on the bow, looking over the grass, watching her cubs move. And just for a few seconds, she just turned her head around just to sort of glance in our direction. She's not actually staring at us. She's just turning her head as if to say, yep, I know you're there and you know I'm here and you're not budging an inch until my cubs are safe. And after a few minutes, the cubs had moved out of that long grass and the lioness came down from the bow. But during those minutes, we had this wonderful view of a lioness, a portrait of a lioness in charge of the situation. It just reminded us that tourists aren't in charge when you're out there in the wild. And this was in the, uh, in the Serengeti in the northern part of Tanzania. Sometimes the grass is quite long, not only high enough to, hold, uh, to hide a small lion cub, Sometimes the grass can be very high. OK, this is rather swampy area in this particular case. This is Amboseli, again, where lots of elephants tend to uh, congregate. And that's only a small elephant. So yeah, perhaps the grass isn't quite as high as it looks. But yes, depending on the time of year, depending on whether the wildebeest have already come through and grazed it all down to nothing, um, you will find every once in a while the grass is high enough to hide, well, even uh, a giraffe, uh, it would seem. Um, some would argue that that giraffe is sitting down. No, 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 no. That giraffe is definitely on its tippy toes. Um, and yes, sometimes the, the, the grass is sort of a meter high or more. And you can definitely lose small animals. So depending on the time of year, you can be told that there's lots of animals out there, but they are rather tricky to see and rather tricky to photograph just because um, they are hiding in the long grass. And of course, small animals are happy to do that because they're hiding from predators. But it makes it more difficult to, uh, to photograph. But it's not always like that. Uh, there are plenty of instances where the grass is nice and small. And here, of course, the grass is only a few centimeters high. This particular picture I like, it was taken at sunrise. So the sun is over on the far top left. And it's uh, illuminating some of the, uh, the, the, the 
adolescent fluff on some of the, the younger zebras there, which perhaps you can't see too well. But the sun is just clipping some of the, uh, the fur of the zebras, and the sun is just clipping the seed heads of some of the grass. But I like it because it just reminds me of how tranquil that day was. We went out at sunrise, dead quiet. We saw these zebra, and I asked the driver to stop, and he said, what have you seen, what have you seen? And I just said, zebra, as if, who wants to take picture of zebra? But this just, to me, encapsulates the grasslands of Africa. It's a small family. Zebras are doing what zebras do, which is eat, which is what most animals do most of the time. One zebra has got its head up to watch out for lions or anything else. One is on lookout, the other are eating. That, to me, just encapsulates what zebra do on the grasslands of Africa. So that, that has now become one of my favorite images. If we have a look at a few birds, I am not uh, a particularly serious bird watcher. My friends are, Sue and Rob Dipple, are very keen on birds, and so they will always, as well as photographing the animals, they will always try and see if they can catch birds and, uh, and see, catch in the photographic sense, of course, um, see if they can catch birds. And they, they have now, I think, managed to see or photograph, or both, about half of the species that are in Kenya. Kenya has about a thousand bird species. I think they've now clocked up something of order, 400 and something. I have not been on as many safaris as my friends. I, I came to this a little bit late, as it were. They've been going on safaris since the 1990s. But this is a reminder that starlings, well, in the UK we have a starling. In East Africa they have starling after starling after starling after starling, and some of them are beautiful colors. Yes, a UK starling might look nice if you catch it in the sunshine and catch the iridescence of its feathers, but that's no match for some of the animals, uh, some of the birds that are out there. Quite a few, um, some of them look rather mean, according to this one in the middle there, but uh, I, think he, I think he just wanted to be fed. It was the sort of starling that knows that tourists might have breadcrumbs or might have um, ordered cake that morning or something, and so this one is definitely after a bit of free food. But you can see the beautiful glossiness that is just hinted at at the UK starlings, but is beautiful in the sunshine of these uh, starlings uh, in Kenya. No lack of small birds. I'm not going to go through them all. The, the names are there if you're interested. But there are plenty of uh, birds, some of which are simply in the grounds of the lodge, and you don't need to go anywhere other than take a camera with you when you're going to breakfast, and you will find various birds in various trees. Others you might catch when you're out on a game drive, um, if you can get into a sort of a forested or bushed or um, treed area. Uh, again, some of them are very col colourful. You might recognise the top right one. It's not actually the same species as the kingfisher in the UK, but of course it looks very similar in terms of its colouring. This one is called the malachite kingfisher. And again, you can see from the others there, there's no lack of colourful birds uh, flitting in the branches pretty much everywhere. Sometimes they cooperate, sometimes they don't. In this particular case, the bee-eaters... Um, lined up on this branch, there's always at least one or two who are facing the wrong way. It's very difficult to get them to turn around. <laughs> Even if you throw rocks at them, they won't turn around, apparently. Um, in this particular case, this was on a river bank and we were in a boat, so we had very little control as to what angle we were at and what the birds were doing, but still they were very cooperative in terms of lining up on the branch there to be photographed. This is the lilac-breasted roller. This is the national bird of Kenya. And we always try and have a crack at this one. Not only is it beautiful colours, the, the blues and the lilacs of the, of the uh, bird itself, but we're always interested to try and catch it in flight because its flight feathers are even more spectacular. But I think all lilac-breasted rollers in Kenya are deaf because every time we creep up on one, it refuses to fly. We go into the branch and we see it sitting there and we ask our driver, is there anything you can do just to scare it off? And uh, we try coughing. <coughs> still there. What about just gently banging the, the van door? Nope, it's still there. It's, there's almost nothing you can do to get these birds to fly, other than put your camera down. As soon as you put... <laughs> so usually one person has to sacrifice, you put your camera down while I'm staring at it and hopefully I'll catch it. But if you persevere and if you catch them at the right place at the right time and you're close enough, you can get beautiful pictures of them in flight 
and the flight feathers are beautiful electric blue. You get this wonderful light blue, dark blue effect. And if you catch them in the sunshine, they are quite spectacular. So what we really want is to try and catch one just landing or just taking off. But getting the timing right on that is a, is a little bit tricky. But it's always good to come back to a lilac-breasted roller. Uh, we try and get those so often we've abbreviated to LBR. Yeah, let's go for an LBR. There's an LBR in the tree. Let's try and catch it and let's see if it flies. And that's one of the joys of going on safari. Even if you go back next year and next year and next year, OK, I can't afford that. But even if you went back time after time to the same place, even if you saw the same animals, you will not see the same animal in the same place and you will not catch it in the same uh, frame, as it were. You'll not catch it at the same wing beat. You can take pictures like this a hundred times over and they will not all be the same. So that's one of the joys of wildlife photography. Plenty of big birds. I'm sure you recognize the top left one as a, a common ostrich, bottom right heron, egret, etc. Perhaps you're not so familiar with the stork and the groundbill, but there are plenty of big birds around as well as the tiny ones in the, in the trees. Some of them are very odd, some of these large birds, such as the hammercock, which uh, is an odd bird in itself and also is unusual in creating one of the largest nests, you know, meters across. Uh, so you can often see the nest before you see the bird. Cory bustards are a very large version of the bustards that exist in that part of the world. And secretary birds, which are raptors with these uh, very odd sort of, not exactly quills, that's not where they get their name from, but this, uh, the feathers on the back of the head there. There are plenty of raptors out there, of course. There are huge numbers of buzzards and eagles and falcons and vultures. So if you're interested in birds of prey, there, is, there are huge numbers there. There's certainly no lack of uh, vultures. They don't simply appear when there's a kill on the ground, though generally speaking, a carcass will tend to attract them from miles around. Vultures will often be circling, but quite often at heights which make them rather difficult to photograph. Um, the auger buzzard in the main part of the picture there. This was a question of, again, in the early morning, virtually all of the birds of prey will try and find thermals to lift them up into the air so that they can see the prey better. And if you position yourself not too far from a hill, there could easily be an updraft as the breeze brushes against the hill and produces an updraft. And quite often you can just position yourself in one spot and just watch the buzzards come and go. And every once in a while they might swing close enough within... 20 meters or so to catch a nice picture with a 300 millimeter lens. Uh, I'm not going to talk through all of these, but a reminder that some birds are quite small, like the little pygmy there, the, um, the uh, excuse me, the gray kestrel. Um, sooty falcons are quite small. Gray kestrels are basically the same sort of size as the kestrels in, in the UK, whereas some of the um, eagles are absolutely huge. But one thing to bear in mind is that even if the eagle is in a very distant tree, the wonders of digital photography is such that you can take a picture of a bird some distance away and then crop it down to get the picture that you want. You no longer have to fight against the grain of film that you used to get whenever you had um, uh, color print or color slide film. You always had grain, and if you tried to blow anything up, you used to get rather unwieldy grain. Now, as long as your original picture is in focus and reasonably sharp, there's usually not no limit, but you can certainly zoom in by a factor of 10 or more on your final image to get not just the whole bird, but for instance, the head of the bird, even though that was sitting in a tree some distance away. It's worth being patient. Every once in a while, you come across a bird sitting on a branch, and again, you think to yourself, is it going to fly? It would be quite nice to get that one with the wings out. But again, sometimes you just have to say either, I'm not going to bother, or yes, I am going to stay here until that damn bird flies. And sometimes it can be one minute later, and sometimes it can be 15 minutes later before it suddenly decides to take off. And hopefully, you've got your camera ready to snap it just as it decides to unfurl its wings. I'm not sure if you know what that is. It's either a bird whose head has exploded, but every so often you catch something a little bit unusual. And when we saw that, we were trying to work it out what it was. I think somebody caught it in a pair of binoculars, trying to work out why its head has exploded, until we realized that, like all raptors, uh, they can move their heads 180 degrees. And it just happened to be looking in the other direction. <laughs> 
Uh, I think that was a tawny eagle. Uh, I think it's a young tawny eagle, but we're not absolutely sure because a lot of juveniles look very similar to each other. But it's just a reminder that sometimes things can catch you by surprise if you look at them from an odd direction, or in this case, if the bird looks in an odd direction. Again, loads of lakes, so loads of opportunity to take pictures of water birds. And again, uh, the picture in the bottom left, I think that's quite nice because it shows uh, Jacana, which is a member of the lily trotter family. And you can see that it's surrounded by lilies. It's basically on the surface of a small pond of water. So that is nice in itself. But if you wanted to, you could zoom in and actually get the bird itself. Because with digital photography, as long as the image is sharp, you can generally zoom in. So you can choose either to have a nice portrait of the bird, or you can have the bird in its environment. You get a better impression of how the bird actually exists by seeing it as a small bird on a huge lily pond. And of course, uh, there will be no lack of flamingo. I'm not going to show you 100,000 flamingo, but every once in a while you can catch them in flight as they zoom in front of you. Um, I think that the most we've seen is something like 100,000 in one lake um, uh, going up and down, as you might have seen in David Attenborough's sort of uh, uh, BBC wildlife programs. But being close to water means that you have the advantage of um, painting with light by picking up the reflections in the water, whether they be of pelicans, whether they be of flamingos. Uh, what have we got there? A heron or a cormorant. Uh, the herons and cormorants are not so different from the sort of uh, equivalent that we get in the UK. But picking up nice reflections is always the case when you're dealing with water birds, but every once in a while you can also pick it up from animals as well, such as um, uh, in shallow water you get a beautiful reflection of the elephant, or on the right this wonderful picture of a zebra. It looks very lonely. I don't know why it was on its own. I think the rest of the herd was just off over the hill slightly, and this zebra just seemed to be standing there contemplating its own existence. It didn't seem to be doing anything. It didn't seem to be drinking. It just seemed to be standing there at sunset, staring into the distance. The one in the middle there um, was a, an impala jumping over what um, I, I keep wanting to use the pointer. In the middle there, there's a little bit of marshy ground. If you look at the blue, if you're trying to work out which is water and which is sky, well, they're both water. Uh, there's no sky in this picture. There's one bit of water and then another bit of water beyond that. And in between, there's a little spit of uh, green grass, which for some reason or another, the impala didn't want to walk over. Perhaps it was just too boggy, too mushy. And we noticed that whenever an impala came close to that, it would leap over it. So got the camera ready, focused on that bit of grass, and then hoped to catch this impala leaping over that particular part of the, uh, of the grass. Close to uh, the lakes, not only do you have all of the wildfowl close to the lake itself, but any lake will be uh, a rich area, a rich ecosystem of land animals. So around Lake Nakuru, a little bit further north than Nairobi, um, this, there was this little portrait of a water buck. I just thought it was a very attractive uh, um, male here with huge ears that it presumably will grow into with time. Um, and in the top right, we have, a, we have a rhino and a zebra that seem to be just enjoying life by having a good old dust bath. So these are just random animals that happen to exist close to the, the shores of, uh, of the Great Lakes that exist on the, in the Rift Valley. Lions don't do anything during the day in the sense that they generally hunt at night. So during the day, they just sleep and play and do very little else, which means lions are relatively easy to photograph. They don't run away if you get close to them. And they've got nothing to do other than basically play to the camera. So in this particular case, a couple of young brothers are just play fighting um, whilst the rest of the herd is a, uh, rest of the pride is asleep, presumably. And occasionally you do find genuine fights amongst animals. I don't know what the, uh, the uh, vultures were doing in the top left. We think perhaps one of the young vultures was being outed from a, from a flock. Uh, hippos are always fighting each other in the water. Water buffalo can be uh, very obstreperous individuals. And on the bottom right, uh, hyenas are trying to steal a kill from a lioness. And so they are basically fighting for the rights to fill their bellies. As well as animals fighting each other, every once in a while they'll try and take a pop at you. So this particular elephant didn't like us getting particularly close. This was a lone male. And elephants that are in groups, in families, are generally fine. They, uh, if you get too close to a, to a group of elephants, 
the, the matriarch and the mothers will protect the young elephants, but if you get a lone male elephant, then sometimes they just want to have a pop at you just for no good reason. So in this particular case, we got within a few tens of meters, got a few pictures. Um, the elephant then flapped his ears, at which point the driver said, let's go. Uh, because as soon as an elephant flaps their ears, that's a sign that they don't particularly want you there. So we went off down the dirt track, and the elephant, just for the hell of it, ran after us for a little while. But luckily, we can drive faster than an elephant can run. Serendipity comes in all the time. You can't plan for anything. Yes, you can plan. You can plan for, let's go out on a game drive. But you don't know where the animals are going to be. In this particular case, we were going nowhere in particular. James and I have the attitude, when we talk to our driver, we don't say, find where the lions are and drive us to the lions. We basically just say, drive. And whatever we see, we see. In this particular case, we were going nowhere. And I noticed this crowned crane on the left-hand side there sitting in the top of a tree. I thought that might make a nice picture. So I asked the driver to stop, set up my camera, on the crown crane on the left, and just as I was about to take the picture, sort of through my other eye, I noticed that in the distance, what presumably is its partner, its mate, came flying up from the distance behind the tree and came up to land next to the other one. And of course, when birds land, out go the air brakes, slow down, come down to rest. And so just at the last second, before it actually landed on that branch, the wings are beautifully splayed. The fact that the second crowned crane just happens to nestle under the wing was pure luck in terms of where we were positioned. And every once in a while, you get that pure luck. And if you get one picture like that at the end of the day, it almost doesn't matter what the rest of the pictures are. You chimp and you think, wow, it worked. I got it. Yes, it was just the right picture. At one point, my friend Jeff said, what's that in the tree? And again, we were going nowhere in particular other than heading off in a general direction. And he said, what's that in the tree? Um, the rest of us said, uh, A, what tree? And B, what are you talking about? And then he said, that tree there, there's something sticking out. Is it just a, is it just the leg of an antelope? Is it some kill that's been left there by a leopard? Not too sure. Let's take a closer look. Oh, it turns out to be a lion sleep in the tree. And again, you can't work these things out. This particular lion seemed to be separated from its pride. There were no other lions around as far as we could tell. And every once in a while, you just get a surprise. Heading back to the lodge one evening, just as the sun is going down, so the light is failing rather dramatically, two cheetahs happened to run alongside the van. They were not chasing us. They were just chasing each other. They were just having a play. Again, probably two brothers. They weren't after a kill. They had probably fed earlier that day, and they were just mucking about. And they just happened to be running alongside the van for a few seconds, at which point I grabbed my camera, took a picture. The shutter speed was way too long because the light was failing, and basically it was, I think, it was either nearly or just after sunset at this point, so it was definitely dusk. And the shutter speed was way too long, but it gives a rather nice impression of just how fast cheetahs can move. It's not simply a question that the camera has moved too much, because you can see the actual movement of the tail itself, which is sort of counterbalancing the fact that the cheetah is trying to do a sharp turn, much as it does when it's hunting a prey. So although it wasn't quite what I intended, at the end of the day, I thought, oh, actually, that's quite nice. If I had been able to do a faster shutter speed, I might have. But as it was, with the amount of light available, that's what I ended up with. But serendipity turned out to be a nice picture anyway. And one of the most serendipitous uh, views we ever got was returning to one of our favorite lodges in Amboseli called Altakai Lodge, which is normally a just basically an arid plain. There's some trees in the distance, but basically it's just a plain. But when we returned in 2019, we found, to our surprise, it was flooded. They had not had a huge amount of rain. Generally speaking, these places tend to get rather... Uh, bad droughts every once in a while. And in this case, there hadn't been an awful lot of rain, but this lake appeared. I presume, maybe, there was some geologic activity and the water table rose for some reason. Um, a lot of the water in this area is melt water that comes down off Kilimanjaro, but quite why there was so much of it, it wasn't clear. 
but the zebras used to go from A to B across this open plain, and now it's flooded, well, they still go from A to B. They're not going to walk around this new lake just because the lake has appeared. If they always go from here to there, they are creatures of habit. Like many herd animals, they will do what they always have done. And if they want to get from one place to another, they just take straight line. So you can see it's not particularly deep. It's only, um, you know, not even half a meter deep. But it gives you this rather unusual juxtaposition of flamingos in the distance and one in the foreground uh, against this uh, set of zebras trudging their way across. And again, the photograph, even though it's not a movie, the photograph is a reminder of A, what we see, B, how unexpected it was, and the fact that even now I can hear the sloshing of the zebras as they go across the lake. Uh, and there was, there's a picture of five of them, but there were, you know, maybe a hundred or two hundred slowly walking in single file. Um, and it took, you know, it took half an hour to watch them just go by. And it was just an amazing sight, something that we would never have expected. So, had enough animals? Well, there we go. I can see some of you yawning in the distance. Yeah, so... Um, uh, sometimes you just get lucky that uh, leopard was quite some distance away. But uh, just luck, the picture of it yawning just happened to look right down its throat. I won't show you the zoom of what its tonsils look like, but basically you could check if it had COVID probably by looking at a picture <laughs> like that. So, at the end of the day, the sun goes down and you have the choice of either just sitting next to the watering hole or, if it's clear, you have the option of astrophotography. So finally, we've got back to the astro of Wild Astro. I decided after the experience of 2003-2005, taking pictures of the sky is great, but I'm fed up with these stars moving. Damn the Earth for rotating, basically. So I built myself a little star tracker. So this one I built for a few quid. Um, and I used that over those dates from 2007 to 2013. I used a home-built star tracker. A few years after using that and after a few safaris, and I'll show you some of the results from that, but after a few years, I decided that it might not be a bad idea to buy a commercial star tracker, mainly because they track for longer. Not necessarily more accurately, but they would track for longer because my home-built star tracker would only track for 15 minutes and then it would need to be reset and then track for another 15 minutes, whereas a commercial star tracker will track effectively indefinitely. So a star tracker is something in which, on which you can bolt your camera, either a camera with a wide-angle lens if you want a big chunk of sky, or a camera with a telephoto lens if you want a, a smaller chunk of sky. But basically, the tracker is just a box with a motor in it that will turn the camera at one revolution per day. So as long as you line it up with the Earth's axis, it will basically compensate for the Earth's motion and hopefully give you pinpoint stars. And that's why we have this tube on the right-hand side, a little polar scope, to make sure you're lined up with the, uh, with the Earth's axis such that the innards and inside this, uh, this particular thing, there's nothing fantastic about it. Uh, essentially, just uh, uh, in the top left there, a motor and a very small motor and gearbox and then a, uh, a worm wheel, which turns at one revolution per day. And obviously, in the bottom left there, batteries and a little bit of electronics to make sure the motor turns at just the right speed. But of course, to make sure a tracker works, to make sure a tracker works, you need to make sure that not only does it turn at once a day, which the, the box will guarantee, but you have to make sure you've lined it up so that it's parallel with the Earth's axis. So in the UK, that's easy. You get yourself uh, an app, and uh, an app on your phone will know where you are in the world, because it's got GPS built in, and it knows what the time is. So it knows precisely where Polaris should be in terms of how much off-center would it be if the North Pole is the center of that uh, reticle, that red reticle there. It tells you where Polaris ought to be, the green dot. Remember, Polaris is not actually at the pole. It's a, a little less than one degree off the pole. So if you want to get it lined up accurately, you have to know where Polaris should be relative to the North Pole. So an app makes that very easy. Just point it at the sky and put Polaris where that green dot is. Bob's your uncle. It will work in the UK. But working in the UK is all very well when you can see Polaris. But what about if you're in Kenya? which is on the equator. 
and remember what that means if we're looking at the Earth, which has uh, an axis of rotation which points to the North Celestial Pole. If we're at latitude, if we're at latitude 52, that means Polaris is 52 degrees high in the sky, very easy to find in the north there, and line up. But if you're on the equator, where is Polaris? Polaris is on your northern horizon. And generally speaking, hidden behind hills or elephants or something else. And if you're one degree south of the equator, then actually Polaris is below your horizon. So what do you do then? Well, basically, a polar alignment scope is of no use to you if you can't see Polaris. And you can't see the South Pole for the same reason. They are basically on opposite sides of your horizon. So either you guess or you say, well, the best I can do is to use a compass to tell me which way is north. And I can use a spirit level to make sure I've got the tilt right. Because remember, the height of the North Celestial Pole above your horizon is the same as your latitude. So if you know where you are, one degree south of the equator, for instance, you know that the North Celestial Pole is one degree south, uh, one degree further down in terms of tilt than the northern horizon. So that sort of works, but bear in mind that magnetic north is not the same as true north and can be quite different. And not only that, but compasses can be affected by metal and magnets in motors, the sort of things that you find inside star trackers, for instance. So you can't put a compass on top of a star tracker and expect it to point north because it will be affected by the internal gubbins of the star tracker. So you have to be a little more creative and uh, I thought about different ways of doing it. So I have got a spirit level attached to my tracker, attached to my tracker to try and get that angle right. But I don't rely on a compass to tell me which way is north. I found a slightly better way of doing it, and that is to use an app like um, Starry Night or Sky Safari or Solarium, whatever your favorite app is. And basically, before I go on holiday, I check, for instance, when is a particular star due north? I simply find out when it crosses the meridian. That star is due north at 10 minutes past 9, for instance. Uh, another star in the plow might be due north at 9.22, for instance. I simply make a note of these times. When is a particular star due north? And then if I go out in the evening and I want to know which way north is, I say, well, it's 9 o'clock now, and I know that star is going to be due north at 10 minutes past 9. So I'll just wait 10 minutes, and then I know that is exactly north. So that's one way of knowing exactly which way you're pointing. Here's an example. This one was taken by Rob. And he simply pointed at the sky on his sky tracker and took a single 20 second exposure. And now we're picking up beautiful dark skies. Yes, the trees are illuminated in order for safety. Generally speaking, most of the paths in most lodges are lit so you can see where you're walking. And some of that light is reflected. So the trees don't look that bright. It's just the way the photograph is showing them. The trees look quite dark. But a single 20 second exposure shows plenty of bright stars and faint stars. And not only that, if you look to a slightly different chunk of sky and add a few frames together, you can start to pick out wonderful detail in the Milky Way. So here we've got the Milky Way running, of course, top left to bottom right. And I'll be pointing out a few of the features that we can see in there in just a moment. But this is a fairly modest 10 exposures of 20 seconds each. It's not as if you need very long photography, long exposure photography, in order to pick up huge amounts of detail in the sky. And that's thanks to the fact that there is no worry about light pollution. There's effectively no background. Whilst we were there, I thought, can I try anything else? I had a crack at the large Magellanic cloud. Not particularly happy with that uh, for a number of reasons. One of the problems is that the large and the small Magellanic cloud are both fairly close to the South Pole. And so on the equator, they're never very high in the sky. So the large Magellanic cloud was only a few degrees above the horizon. And so I thought I'd try and catch it. And I can just about see the, the tarantula nebula as that little knot of white on just left of center. But uh, it wasn't quite as nice as I had hoped it was going to be. I also tried a different chunk of the Milky Way. The previous one by Rob was looking at the center of the Milky Way. I looked a little bit further along to see what I could catch. And I found that I could see Alpha and Beta Centauri there. And if we go further over in the middle, we have the Southern Cross, which is a little bit tricky to pick out. It's, one of, it's, a, it's a rather odd situation that the, the deeper you take 
photographic images, the more difficult it is to see the bright stars, simply because there are so many faint stars. So in other words, the bright stars will show up easily by eye, but as soon as you take long exposures and start to bring out those faint stars, it becomes rather overcrowded with a million stars or more. So there's the Southern Cross. We've got the jewel box cluster just to its left and the coal sack nebula, that dark region in the bottom left of the crux. Further over to the right is the Eta Carina uh, nebula, where we have a big star, Eta Carina, which looks like it's rather unstable, and that's why it's, it's blowing off all of this material that's forming the Eta Carina nebula. And it's thought that Eta Carina is unstable and perhaps coming to the end of its life. Whether or not this one goes supernova before Betelgeuse does, well, I think they're sort of you know, in a little bit of a battle to see which one is going to explode first. But this is my attempt to give you an idea of what the Milky Way is like. From England, if you can get away from the lights, you can see the Milky Way spread across the sky. Not perhaps quite this far south, because that's the centre of the Milky Way, roughly in the centre of the image. And so from England, we can't see the lower right portion of the Milky Way. But this is my attempt to show you what the Milky Way looks like from Africa. If that's what it looks like in the UK, then from Africa, it really is stunningly bright. And yes, you can see all of that sort of detail. That is my attempt to represent what it looks like when you look up at the sky. Without binoculars, without any other aid, you can see the dust lanes and the bright regions in that sort of detail. This is quite a large chunk of sky. It was a 35 millimeter lens, and as you can perhaps tell from the black rectangles, it's a mosaic of different images. So this is quite a large chunk of sky we're looking at. And yes, you can see that level of detail. We were trying to work out, not quite successfully, we were trying to work out whether the Milky Way was casting shadows. It was that bright, we were almost convinced that we could see by the light of the Milky Way. And if that's what it looks like by eye, then of course, as soon as you go to astrophotography, you start to pick out the color that you can't see. The previous image simply had the color taken out to give you a representation of what it is you see by eye. Bright though it is, the color receptors in your eyes are not sensitive but astrophotography will bring out the colors that exist there. Comparing with the, one of the very early images that I showed you back from 2003, that's what I got with slide film, and the, uh, the Scorpius is there in the sort of bottom right of that um, rectangle that's been angled to agree with the orientation of the main image. So Scorpius is clearly visible, but there's hardly anything of the Milky Way. Whereas now we've got just the opposite problem. There's huge amounts of Milky Way, shed loads of faint stars, but so many faint stars, we've almost lost all of the bright stars. They are there, and if I point out Scorpius to you, you can see there it is. But it's very much more difficult to see compared to the other image, just because there's so much going on in that uh, the Milky Way image. If I just concentrate on the central part, the, what appears to be a very bright star top center, just above center, and another bright star over to the left are not stars. That's Jupiter and Saturn, taken from um, 2019, again, before Jupiter had moved further over. And given that this is a few images stitched together, if you start with a 10 or 20 megapixel image, and then you make a mosaic of the Milky Way, you've got a huge number of pixels. And if you wish, you can just keep on zooming. And then you realize there are so many star clusters and nebulae buried in that image. You can spend ages just zooming into it on your PC monitor or whatever. And with a star atlas, start looking at what it is that you've managed to catch there. What I've circled here are just the brightest of the nebulae and the star clusters. These are the ones that have Messier numbers. I haven't even attempted to label all the clusters that are labeled with NGC numbers. Notice the Messier numbers stop, implying that there's nothing interesting going on down here. Well, far from it. There's a huge amount of clusters and nebulae there, but Messier couldn't see that far south. So Messier stopped identifying them as of that horizon, which is a little bit higher than his horizon as seen from France. Although I was very pleased to get a wide angle shot of the Milky Way, especially considering where we started from in terms of rather ropey images back in 2003, I thought that's wonderful, but I wonder if I can do any better. So I had a look at that, which is 
M8 Lagoon and M20 Triffid Nebula, with a wide-angle lens, they are, of course, quite small. But I wondered, what if I put a, my telephoto lens, my favorite lens for taking pictures of zebras and lions, what if I put that lens on the star tracker and see what I get with that? And then I found that I could get a nice picture of M8 Lagoon, lovely pink colors coming out from the hydrogen emission of that nebula. M20, notice there's a contrast between pink from hydrogen and blue from reflection. There's a reflection nebula and a hydrogen nebula. So you get the beautiful contrast between the two colors. And uh, there's a limit to how much you can blow that up, but I decided to blow it up just to see how much could come out. And yes, the stars are no longer quite pinpoints because <coughs> I've zoomed in quite a bit, but you can see the beautiful colors. You can see the dust lanes of the Triffid, giving it its name, the Triffid Nebula, and you can see the contrast between the pink and the blue coming out. So it's a reminder that star trackers are not just for wide-angle pictures of the sky. You can put a telephoto lens on a star tracker and still produce some very nice images. So I suppose the take-home message for this particular talk is... If you're going to go anywhere nice, if you're going to go anywhere away from pollution, if you're going to take a holiday away from cities and get somewhere close to dark skies, think about packing a star tracker. They don't weigh that much. We're not talking about a huge equatorial mount for a telescope. If you're taking a camera anyway, why not take a star tracker? It'll add maybe one kilo to your 20-odd kilos of luggage, but that will enable you to take images similar to the ones I've shown here. So I think I've overrun, so I'd better call that the end. And uh, thank you all for listening.